Well, welcome to Lecture 5. It's a synopsis lecture. It's on ethical behaviour and corporate social responsibility. Again, just to remind us, A, that we're supposed to be enjoying ourselves in this learning journey, but also that this is a synopsis lecture, not the full lecture, and the full lecture should be used for study and reference purposes. We're up to week five, or lecture five, on ethical behaviour and social responsibility. What are we going to cover this lecture? We're going to look at ethical behaviour, we're going to look at corporal, corporate social responsibility, and again, the learning points. So let's have a look at lecture five. Let's have a look at the definition and contemporary context of ethical behaviour. So while ethical beliefs lead the, to the development of laws and regulations to prevent certain behaviours or encourage others, ethical standards and laws can and do change over time. So things change and as, and as our uh, ethical beliefs change, uh, the law can change as well. But from the perspective of the legal system, its only basis isn't the law, as you can see on the graphics on the right, or on the images on the right. That we have our, our ethical uh, standards and we have the legal system. In some parts they cross, but ethics is much bigger than the law. Or the law can be much bigger than uh, more about, uh, about things than just ethics. So, Ethics can be open to interpretation, and managers must decide what's appropriate when they use their organisation's resources to produce goods and services. So what's the definition of ethical behaviour? It's what is morally accepted as good and right, as opposed to bad and wrong, in a particular social context. It's a social expectation that all managers and staff will act in accordance with high ethical and moral standards. And ethics is not about strict adherence to law, but is about behaving within a broader moral code which may be individually principled, based, or common to society as a whole. And the point that I'm making here is the fact that you and I might have different ethical beliefs, but from a work perspective, we're expected to hold the highest standards of, uh, of, uh, of uh, behaviour towards uh, what, uh, not only what we do, but to our staff. An ethical behaviour consists of individuals respecting the dignity, diversity and rights of other people. Basically acting ethically means doing the right thing in any given situation. Everything we do is a choice, so ethical behaviour is always choosing the right thing to do no matter what the circumstances or context. So again, it's about this moral self-belief, this strong belief that you need to do the right thing, not only by yourself and those around you, but also by society as a whole. The, dif the difficulty is the dividing line between what is right and what is wrong, and this presents challenges for people on an everyday basis. So often I'll say, hey, is that right? Well, I think it's right, so I'll act on it, but it could be wrong. So it's, again, back to that uh, that idea of individual belief. And you and I might have very different ideas on what is right and what is wrong. So ethical standards can be described as a set of values to which we subscribe. And they include things such as honesty, fairness, equality, scrupulousness, oh, what a difficult word to say, empathy, and respecting diversity. So, there is a need for ethical caution when dealing with certain situations. They include superior and subordinate relationships, customers, competitors and suppliers, and the various regulatory authorities. And some of the common ethical violations involve financial dealings, contract situations, protecting information, receiving gifts and entertainment, kickbacks for favours, preferential pricing arrangements, and employee appointments, professional development, and terminations. Now, one that I haven't put up there, which has been in the news uh, as this lecture is being presented, uh, is one about sexual propriety in the workplace. And again, that's a, quite a common ethical violation that does occur. All disciplines, all subjects, the academic world looks at it and it puts it into specific categories. And the categories for ethical behaviour 
are shown on this slide. There's utilitarianism. Let's talk about that first. It's ethical behaviour which delivers the greatest good to the greatest number of people. This is what governments do. They try and be utilitarian. You know, the health system is the greatest good for the greatest number of people. It doesn't mean that, uh, that every person gets every last dollar spent on them. It's to spread the government's uh, financial capacity to pay across the greatest number of people. Individualism is ethical behaviour which is best for one's own long-term self-interest. And again, I've worked with people who have been very strongly flavoured with individualism. It's about them. They're going to achieve. They're going to get to the top and they don't give, uh, they don't, uh, give uh, any time or effort to anything that won't promote them uh, in a competition with their peers. There's also, from ethical behaviour, there's the moral rights category, where ethical behaviour which respects that uh, fundamental rights are shared by all human beings. You know, freedom, justice, equality, and all of those things we spoke of earlier. And then there's the judicial rights, which is ethical behaviour which is fair and impartial in its treatment of all people. So, from a, from a manager, you really need to be concerned about uh, the first three in particular. Uh, utilitarianism, ethical behaviour which delivers the greatest good to the greatest number of people. Individualism, uh, you'll observe that in people. And the moral rights, the broader aspects of ethical behaviour. Let's talk about ethical dilemmas. People often come across ethical dilemmas in the workplace. It's a quandary that people may find themselves in when they have to decide if they should act in a way that might help another person or group. So it's the right thing to do, even though it may be against their own self-interest or ethical standards. And the most commonly cited ethical dilemma is between an imperative not to steal and an obligation to care for your starving family when you can do only, which you can only do that if you steal money to buy them food. We come across ethical dilemmas quite often in the workplace. Someone might come and ask you for help uh, in a work sense and you know it's against the company's policy. So you're now stuck with a decision to make about whether to assist the person and uh, on a person-to-person -person basis or in fact go against the company policy. Joseph Stalin said a single death is a tragedy but a million deaths is a statistic. And that from an ethical perspective raises a question of well what about a hundred deaths? What about five? Uh, what are the measures of, uh, of uh, what's a tragedy and what's a statistic? And one of, the, one of the cases that's always used and discussed by ethicists is the trolley bus case, whereby a trolley bus is coming down the track and it's going to kill five people and you're there with a lever and you can make a decision to change the trolley bus and kill one person only. And you need to make that decision. And simply Kill one, kill five. It's an easy decision. But then if you put all sorts of externalities into it, like the five people are all children, and the one is an old person. And all of these complications come in to our thinking when we're deciding on, uh, on what to do with eth ethical dilemmas. Some steps to resolve ethical dilemmas are recognise and clarify the situation. Give it a lot of thought. Gather all the facts that you can. List all your options. Test each option. Is it legal? Is it right? Is it beneficial? And then you make your decision. Then you double check the decision by asking, how would I feel if my family found out? How would I feel if my decision was printed in the local newspaper or put on Facebook? Then and only then, take action. By that stage, your conscience has come up with, uh, or you've come up with a solution that your conscience can accept. The rule of three is a religious tenet uh, held by some people which states that whatever energy a person puts out in the world, be it positive or negative, it will be returned to the person three times. So this means the more good that you do, you will have three times more positive energy around you. And conversely, the more evil that you do, you will have three times more negative energy around you. And the rule of three is good to remember about behaviours. The fact that you need to do, back to the thought of utilitarianism, you need to do the greatest good. Uh, for, uh, for all. Let's talk about universal considerations of ethical behaviour and this goes to the this goes right to the root cause of some of the environmental discussions that are occurring in the world uh, in a, in a, at the moment or have been for about 30 years or so. 
So there's no absolutes when discussing ethics. The outcome is that unethical behaviour results in harm and ethical behaviour brings universal benefits. And the tragedy of uh, the commons scenario underlines this point. So suppose that we live in an agricultural community, we have common land that everybody has equal right to access. And pursuing self-interest, each farmer acts to make the maximum use of the free resource to graze their own cattle and sheep. Collectively, the farmers overgraze the land, which quickly becomes worn out. Then a strong wind blows away the exposed topsoil, topsoil, so the common land is destroyed. So this leads us to the view that the pursuit of individual self-interest with no consideration for societal interests, so if I just pursue my interests and don't worry about society, leads to, to disaster for each individual and for society as a whole, because the scar scarce and irreplaceable resources have been destroyed. And so the the tragedy of the commons tells us that not only are we responsible for our own behaviours, how they affect us, but we're responsible for them, how they affect society as a whole. Some commonly accepted universal ethical principles include the sanctity of life. Uh, regardless of what religion you follow, generally these ones apply. The sanctity of life, keeping promises, dignity of life, privacy, justice, confidentiality. Ownership rights, freedom, equality, loyalty, truthful dealings, and public good. If you work in an organisation these days, many organisations have a code of ethics or a code of conduct or, or a similar name, uh, and they prescribe the required staff behaviours. So what the company does is they look at societal ethics, they look at the professional ethics, so if you're an accountant, there's certain professional ethics, an engineer, there's professional ethics, an aviator, there's professional ethics, and they look at individual ethics and they draw up their organisation's code of ethics. And for a lot of organisations, uh, if you, uh, if you um, uh, behave in a manner which isn't consistent with the organisation's code of ethics, uh, that's a cause for, uh, for you to leave the organisation. So. We've now finished talking about ethical behaviour. I'm now going to move on and talk about corporate social responsibility. And corporate social responsibility is the obligation of organisations to behave in an ethical and moral manner. Many organisations are now using their social responsibility index, so the body shop is a good example, as part of their business strategy. And, uh, you know, even people like McDonald's, you know, any suburb you go around, you find McDonald's, uh, used uh, used uh, uh, packaging everywhere uh, if it's within one or two kilometres of a McDonald's store, but they subscribe to these clean-up days uh, to uh, to uh, attract uh, uh, favourable comment, for example, about their behaviours. So, so there's uh, all sorts of different strategies that organisations use to create uh, a real or a perceived social responsibility index scale. There's when it comes to uh, corporate social responsibility, there's the classical uh, view of it or perspective and there's a socio-economic perspective. And the classical view is management's only social responsibility is to maximise profits for the shareholders. So I'm running an organisation, I don't particularly care about society as a whole, I only care about my shareholders. And you hear CEOs talking about this in the business press all the time. I'm only here for my shareholders, it's all about return on investment not about anything else. Then there's the socio-economic perspective that management's social responsibility goes beyond making profits and so we're back to that tragedy of the commons, uh, the universal aspect, not only about uh, being good for the company but good for society as a whole and the need is to, uh, you need to uh, conduct your operations to protect and improve society's welfare. Some of the aspects of classic, uh, the classic perspective versus the socio-economic perspective, I won't go through them all uh, in this synopsis lecture, but on one, the objective is prox uh, profit maximisation, uh, and down the bottom, uh, they say there's a re reduced need for additional government regulation. Just let us get on and do what it is that we do. Over on the other side, the socio-economic perspective, uh, 
there's a public expectation that they'll worry about society as a whole. They're looking at long-term profits, the company's staying there forever, that they don't def uh, take out all the trees of the forest, that they'll be able to have long-run profits uh, and, uh, and uh, again, society will benefit. That there's ethical obligations and so on and so forth. So the classic perspective, the, you know, in the, in the uh, most extreme form, just plunder, they take what they can, and the socioeconomic uh, in the extreme form, uh, do everything they can for society. Some of the, uh, again, we're back to categories. We, uh, in, in textbooks, etc. everything goes back into these models or, or categories. And in this case, companies that have low social responsibility are considered to be obstructionist. Uh, those that uh, sit a little bit further towards the high social responsibility side can take a defensive uh, strategy. Some take an accommodative strategy. Oh yeah, look, we're doing the best we can with what we've got. And others are very proactive. So from that perspective, uh, you can classify and use those as discussion points to describe organisations. I remember uh, Volvo at one stage, uh, first um, back in uh, maybe the late 70s or so, they started advertising that their cars were fully recyclable. And uh, so again, that was uh, maybe accommodative uh, in that category. Uh, in the full lecture, I talk at length about uh, a case study, the uh, BP Deepwater Horizon accident, uh, which occurred off America about five years ago now. Again, uh, an excellent case study uh, to bring out some points about corporate social responsibility. Well, these are the learning points from these lectures, uh, from this lecture uh, about ethical behaviour and uh, also about corporate social responsibility. So we've covered ethical behaviour, we've covered corporate social responsibility, and there's some learning points there for you. Next week, uh, we look at organisational design. Again, I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to talking to you next lecture.